desire of our heart. You are with us and you are for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 To God be the glory. We lift up our voices. Sometimes you just want to hear our voices. So can I get a hallelujah this morning, everybody? Can I just get a hallelujah as loud as you can? You're still standing this morning. You're still alive this morning. Things may not be the way we want them to be, but God is in control. And we have something to be joyous about, that our Savior lives. We have something to be thankful for, he provides. We have something to be grateful for, he gives us direction. We have something to shout for when he corrects us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you continue to do while we pray this morning. We want to pray for those who need to hear from you, those who are hurting, those who are struggling to try to understand what we see, what they're dealing with. So Lord, I ask for your supernatural presence to just engulf the believers in such a tangible way that they'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are God. Now, Lord, speak to me and speak through me as the word which goes forth will penetrate the hearts of those who've come here and are online to receive. It's in your holy name. Let the church say amen. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. As we always say, you can keep, let it go. You can keep on, you just bring it down slowly. That's, yes, that's how we do it. And when we get ready to bring it out, we just bring it on down softly. We don't cut it out. Amen. I'll tell you what, what I love about what we have continued to do here at By God Inspired Fellowship, we did not let a pandemic stop us from sharing the gospel. We continue to go forward and share the good news in such a way that is impact lives. And I'm just thankful for seven years completion of public ministry at BGI as we are now in year eight. And you know, we're, we're gonna be celebrating a lot over the next 30 days and it will culminate uh, on a virtual uh, presentation on my birthday, which is February 10th when I turn 50 years old. Someone told me the other day I'm a half century. I think that was my daughter. I'm a half century. Why do they have to make us feel so old, right? Daddy, you're half century old. Were you around when Abraham Lincoln was around? Praise be the God. I'm not that old. But uh, there is a word this morning. And if you all could stand, as we always do, you know how we do it. And those of you online, make sure you have your word. Uh, and and uh, we're going to hold this word up. I got a tablet today. This word is Jesus. This word, I believe it, I receive it in his holy name. You, you may be seated, brothers and sisters. You know, uh, we talked a lot about what it is to make him Lord of your life last week. And one of the things that we um, learned is that many people have tried to love him but not make him Lord. They, they love him, but, but being Lord means something higher has authority over me. And so when something higher has authority over us, that means that when we are in error in any given way, what has authority over us, we will submit to it and change once we realize we've gone astray. So this morning I ask you brothers and sisters and those of you online, have you made Jesus Christ, Yeshua, his Hebrew name, Lord of your life? Have you made him Lord of your life? Because we got a lot of people in, in society who say they like him, they love him, but he's not Lord of their life. So I want you to turn with me, brothers and sisters, to Luke 418. And one of the things that I do understand about the Savior and the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it does set people free. He sets people free. The gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel is he came, he lived, he died, 
And he was raised from the dead three days later with all power. And now he sits at the right hand of the father. And anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me tell you something. We know what you believe in by how you live. Whatever you believe in, whatever you think it on, whatever you have given authority over you, that's what you believe in. And so you will live. Brothers and sisters, do you believe in him this morning? Do you believe in what he's telling you? Do you believe in his word, the wisdom that comes from his word? The word of God says, above all things, get wisdom. And all that getting, get an understanding. Some of you don't want the understanding from God. You just want to lead, be led by your flesh. And that's the thing that we're seeing today. But I want you to turn with me to Luke 4, verses 18 through, through 21. Luke 4, verses 18 through 21. This is Jesus. Jesus is, man, he's, he's bad. Bad. Bad in a good way. And he comes to his hometown, to the synagogue. And it's tradition that scripture is read. So he comes before the people because they've heard about all of the stuff he's done in other places. He's healed people. He's done so much. So you would think by what he has shown and what they have heard that they would be open to a deliverance message, a deliverance that shows that there are people who are in captivity. So he goes before the altar and he, he reads the scripture and it's captured in Luke 4 verses 18 through 21. I'm reading from the NIV version. And it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sights for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in you hearing. Brothers and sisters, I, I want to share with you, if you would just oblige me for about 20 minutes, crushing the influence of the oppressor, crushing the influence of the oppressor. Who is the oppressor? Ephesians 6, 12 tells us we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against wickedness, against the rulers and authorities in high places. The ruler and authority governed by the prince of the power of the air, which is the spirit of the Antichrist, which worketh through the children of disobedience that's found in Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. We were once under the oppression of Satan. Satan is the great oppressor. Satan his tactics are cunning, and he embeds himself into worldly things. And then he pulls people in. He draws them into something. They're masked as something else. And he did it in the garden, and he did it so cunning. He masked his demonic oppression around knowledge by tempting Adam and Eve and telling them that if you do this thing, eat of the tree, then you will be as gods because God doesn't want you to have that knowledge. So behind any worldly thing, the enemy masked it as something righteous, but behind it, it's something that will set you free. And what we know in the word of God is that there is nothing new under the sun that is uncommon to man. And so it is written. And so what we have also learned about 666, which is the number of a man and the mark of a beast, the beast, is it's about repetition. Repetition. What are we repeating? 
repetition of disobedience. We have not learned from the past because the enemy wants to keep you blind to the destructive nature of it. So obviously the mark of the beast is disobedience. And those who have rejected the knowledge of God will continue to operate in cycles, patterns of disobedience. That's why the book of Romans and Paul says in Romans 12 too, don't conform to those patterns, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. The mind, the mind, brothers and sisters, when the Israelites, the children of God, you're a child of God. When they were in bondage for 400 years, their cries got so loud that God swooped in and showed up and showed out. It got real bad before it got real good. You got to go through some bad stuff before it can get real good because it has to get so bad so you'll know what good is. Brothers and sisters, what I love about the repetitious nature of disobedient children is that you know where they stand and how they live. Jesus says, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. Another version says in Luke 4 and 18, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? When he was walking in the earth to set the captives free. Let's just be clear. Rome had authority and occupied the land of Judea. But the Israelites, the children of God, they were not in physical bondage. They were not slaves to Rome. They just were governed by an idolatrous society. And so in that situation, what is the Savior Yeshua talking about? Set the captives free. We're free. I could hear him saying that. We're free. What do you mean we're, we're, we need to uh, uh, be set free? We can go to and from where we want to go. They were under the authority of an idolatrous nation. And then within that nation, you had gatekeepers, people who benefited from the tactics of the enemy. And they were keeping people out of the knowledge of God while saying they're teachers of the law. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, they would say to Jesus, they would say to him, we are the teachers of the law. You don't teach us. See, what we have to understand, believers, as human beings, if we don't see kingdom first above any and everything, the way we teach the gospel will come from a place of bias. Bias inside of us. Everybody has some bias in them. But what we've learned is what the Holy Spirit gives us is the ability not to allow that bias to come out in how we treat our neighbor. And we certainly do not allow the biases that we each have to come out in the form of human legislation that tries to oppress people. Jesus said, these were threats to that institution, threats to the religious leaders who benefited from an idolatrous governing society that allowed them to have some authority in the land. But yet in John 10 and 10, Jesus says those folks are part of the devil. He says, I, I, I have come to set you free, but let me tell you what they're trying to do, that those Pharisees are the ones who come to steal, kill, and destroy. They try to tell you, I already have one brother, thank you so much. They try to tell you that they can teach you the law, that they can show you the way, but they're not even on the inside. They're on the outside of the gates trying to tell you they're the gatekeepers and they're trying to tell you this is the way, but they're not even in. He says in his word, I'm the truth, the way and the life. Nobody gets to the father, but through me. They didn't like that because what Jesus was doing in this moment in Luke 4, 18 through 21, he was removing the influence of a demonic society that had allowed it to lead their actions. He was removing it and he says, I'm recovering the sight of those who looked at that as the only way. You've been influenced by 
a demonic society, influenced in so many different ways to the point you think that is the way to live. And then you look at people who have embraced certain things, their biases played out when they remained silent on things that rejected the knowledge of God, but they weren't actually the ones being impacted by it. They stayed silent. And God said, you gotta speak out. The gospel frees, brothers and sisters, but some want to use it to oppress. See, that's what the enemy does. The enemy takes the word because he knows the word is truth. He knows he can't get around the word. So the enemy takes the word as he did with uh, Yeshua in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He came to him on that last day and he began to tempt him and he, he gave him a half a word. He said, if you truly are the son of God, why don't you throw yourself over? And then the angels will recover you as written. And then he told him, if you're hungry, you know, turn those rocks into bread. <laughs> and eventually the son of God said, it is also written. It is also written. In other words, you coming at me with a half word, but the word who is the savior is going to give you the full word. The full word is going to set you free. The full word will not allow you to be in bondage. See, the enemy was trying to use a part of a word to keep you in bondage. And you thought because it was the word that they were given, that it was the full word. But the whole word of the gospel of Jesus Christ sets us free. That's why they didn't want you to learn how to read. That's why they didn't want you to get an education. But here's the thing, even beyond all of the reading and all of the education, what the Savior wants are those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So even if you can't read, you have a heart to love him with everything you have and make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Yes, he will set you free and move you up higher and higher. The devil's scared right now. His time is winding down. And so, brothers and sisters, it is written that you will know people by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. You will know whether or not they're false. You know whether or not they're true. By their fruit, character, character, character. If character did not matter, the Savior would not have said, you will know them by their fruit. Well, what is fruit? Fruit actions what are actions actions are movements things we do where does it begin in the mind who has authority over the mind well in order for you to really know who has authority over someone's mind you have to look at their actions if the mind is governed by the spirit of God, then the actions will be lined up a certain kind of way. We'll get there in just a second. But if the mind is governed by the mark of the beast, 666, the number of a man, then their actions will be repetitious and it will be disobedient. So have you made Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Because we have to accept the whole word. We don't pick and choose different verses. We Except the whole word, the whole word, not just one thing that fits our comfort, but the whole word that has us to look inwardly and ask ourselves, am I living according to his word in this area of my life? And be willing to take the correction. Listen, the word of God says all have fallen short of the glory of God. All, all, that's me, you, everybody. But something happens, brothers and sisters. We're transformed, but it comes with repentance. If my people who are called by my name, that, see, we read all of that, but let's understand if my people, first of all, he still considers you his people. Are you called by my name or are you called by the name of some other person? If my people who are called by my name, this is the second Chronicles 714, if my people, who are called by my name, not by the name of Vince, not by the name of Greg, not by the name of Lorraine, not by the name of Rhonda, not by the name of Cheryl or Nathan or Marshall, but if my people who are called by my name, that name is Yahweh, will humble themselves, not pride, 
not proud, but humble thyself. Seek my face, not the face of Rhonda, not the face of Nathan, not the face of Cheryl, but my face. Whose face? Yahweh's face. Pray. Turn from the wicked ways. What are ways? The fruit, the fruit that's wicked, the things that we see, the actions that don't line up with his word. Brothers and sisters, there's a crushing the influence of an oppressor. There's a crushing going on right now. So here's the deal, brothers and sisters. You will know them, but they will be attacked by anyone led by demonic oppression. Who are you known by? You're known by the Savior. So you're going to be attacked if you're his. Brothers and sisters, there's been a lot of talk about the church is now about to be persecuted in America. The church has always been persecuted. The true church. Second Corinthians three, verses 16. The apostle Paul says, don't you know you are the temple? You what spirit dwells in you there's a passage of scripture in the word of god that says the father wants to dwell in those who worship him in spirit and in truth he wants to dwell in the temples he created not physical human temples but 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 temples he created talking about human beings so if you are a child of god going way back to the time when jesus said this is the acceptable year of the lord You've already been persecuted. You've already been ostracized. You've been marginalized. You've been made to feel like you're less than in so many different ways by the oppressor who is oppressed himself. You have already been persecuted. Brothers and sisters, let's be clear. How do you know that you're his? How do you know? How do you know you're his? Well, in John 14, 26, he told the disciples that he's coming, he's going away, he's going back to the kingdom. Don't worry, I'm going to send you the great comforter. The comforter will teach you all things. You got to want the comforter. In other words, you got to make the Savior Lord of your life. You got to say, I give you authority over me. I accept your word even when I might have learned something else from someone else that didn't line up with you. But if I see your word and you correct me, I take it. So those folks who want any of us who want to be corrected by the Savior, want to make sure we're walking lock and step with him, he will come and dwell in you and your character will change. It's called the fruit of the spirit. Turn with me to Galatians 5, 22 through 26. Character matters, brothers and sisters. Don't ever let anyone tell you that character does not matter in anything that is about God, especially when we make people as if they're gods. They better have a godly character. It is written, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Let's go back. Those who belong to Christ Jesus has crucified the flesh. What are you crucifying? You're crucifying your biases. Everybody has, has a bias. My bias might be I, uh, I, I like my pencils to be extra sharpened, and you know, but you keep bringing me this dull pencil, and I don't like you for that. I'm making that up. But we all have some bias. And then there's something called implicit bias. When you, you, you have been shaped by iniquity in such a way that it informs how you see other people, but you will not acknowledge the fact that you have this bias, but your unwillingness to recognize that others are oppressed in certain ways, you're implicit to it. You are implicit because of your silence. Self-control. What is self-control? The only way you're going to have self-control is if you have the Holy Spirit in you, because trust me, the greatest threat to ourselves is us. So we have to submit to the Lord, the Lord of our lives. He has authority over us, and he will give us the ability to say no to those things in the flesh that want us to do things we know don't line up with God's word and not be afraid 
of the pushback of people who still do not have self-control. It says here, you crucified the flesh with passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited. It's about me. I'm the only one that matters. My voice is more important than yours. Let us not become provoking. I'm not gonna provoke you. I'm not gonna do anything that's gonna cause you to stumble. And whatever we do, don't envy each other because we all have fallen short. That's, if, that, that's, that's when you're living according to the spirit. Now the westernized church, brothers and sisters, this is where we live, um, has benefited from the oppressor's tactics. I'm not saying that the westernized church ha has actually done things, but it's benefited. Made you feel like you were less than. Did they stand up for you? Told you to love your neighbor as yourself and love God, forgive, but yet it remains silent related to others who did things that caused other people harm because maybe they were afraid to speak out on what is true, the gospel, because they knew that if they spoke out on it, the same stuff that was happening to other marginalized populations, they would feel the wrath of that demon. See, sometimes, brothers and sisters, the only way for people's eyes to be opened is if they experience what others have experienced. Walk in my shoes for one day, then you'll know what it's like to, to, to deal with certain things. So God gives people those experiences. And then in that moment, there's a revelation. There's an epiphany. Uh-uh, this is not right. It's only not right when it happens to you. But the beauty of it is, I declare on this day that what we've seen in this land was for our good. I mourn for people who still walk in blindness to what is right before them. The enemy is cunning and he will use different world secular movements to try to pull you in. That's why it's important, brothers and sisters, as the church, you being the temple, that you don't give your identity over to any movement that pretends to be of God, but has something behind it that's more sinister. When the Savior said, the scriptures are fulfilled in Luke 4, 18. They ran them out of town. They were offended. All they wanted was the benefits of his healing, but they didn't want to be delivered by the word. They want the benefits of the power, but don't want to submit to the Lord. They want all of the benefits as they've been operating through time, but there is no submission because in their mind, submission is weak. So how do we act when we don't submit to the word of God? How do we act when we don't submit to his will? What does our character look like when we think submission is weak? Turn with me to Galatians 5, 19 through 21. See, Paul understood this. And as he's speaking to the church at Galatia, he, he's given them some understanding about certain things because, you know, we all have fallen short at times and we have to receive a correcting word from the apostle. And he says, you, my brothers and sisters, Actually, it's Galatians 5, and I think I went back up to about 16. But anyway, you, my brothers and sisters, we're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another. This is Galatians 5, 13 through 21. Serve one another humbly in love. I want to stop there for just one second. Serve one another humbly in love. You can't serve another person humbly in love when you're prideful, when you see yourself above somebody, when you think something is all yours. But God created all of the earth and he created everything around us. And the only one who owns it is the Father. But when you think you own it, you won't be humble. You won't be humble, you'll be prideful. And you'll be threatened when God shows favor. 
for other people. You'll think something is being taken from you, but the reality is God is blessing other people too. It goes on to say, don't use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, uh, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not glorify the desires of the flesh. And then this is what he begins to explain in terms of the flesh. These are the things, the fruit, the, the works of the flesh, the actions. It's the character of an individual. It says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Talking about the law of Moses. In other words, it was crushing. You're walking above it when you are walking in the Spirit. You're standing on it. It becomes the bedrock of how you live. And then it goes on. The acts. The acts of the flesh. This is the outward manifestation. The things that you see. This will let you know what has a person's mind? The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, impurity and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. What is idolatry? Idolatry is when you worship other things. You worship governments. You worship lands. You worship anything other than God. And your whole life, your whole foundation is shaped on what you worship. And then when you feel like God is giving other people opportunities, you think that it's being taken from you because your idol is being destroyed in your life. And then you resort to manipulation, lying, all of this other stuff. See, lying is a form of manipulation. See, the, the devil is the great manipulator. He told Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, particularly Eve, ah, eat that tree, eat that fruit, because God knows that if you eat of the tree, you will be as gods as them and will know and have knowledge. That was the lie, and they believed the lie. And it put them in a delusion. They had a chance to recover in Genesis 3, but they did not repent. So judgment came against Adam and Eve. But instead of God destroying them, he put them out of his presence. He pushed them out of his presence. And then he loved them so much that he gave them the essential things they needed to survive apart from him until they realized they needed to reach back for the tree of life. Some folks don't think they need to reach back for the tree of life because they think they're entitled to it. <laughs> but they haven't made him Lord of their life. What else does it say here? It says here that um, hatred is one of those acts of the flesh. Discord. Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. What is selfish ambition? It's all about me. It's not about you. I'm not going to love you. You got to love me. And if you don't love me, I hate you. It's my way, not any other way. Selfish ambition. Dissensions, factions, and envy. Factions is tribalism. But the only tribe we as children of God need to aspire to it's being a part of the tribe of the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah. Who is the Lion of Judah? His name is Yeshua. His name, a.k.a. Jesus Christ. He's the truth, the way, and the life. So it goes on to say, drunkenness, which basically is you're intoxicated with the ways of this world. In those times, people love to get intoxicated with alcohol and all this stuff, and you still see it today. But when we go deeper in the word of God, intoxication is when you are in a relationship with this world to the point that you are intoxicated by it. You are blind to the wickedness. You are blind to your own actions. But everything that's in you is coming out freely because you have no self-control. It goes on to say, 
as I warn you, as I did before, those that act this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, the church, the true church, that's identified in the book of Revelation 2, verses 8 through 10, uh, is the church that truly loves, the church that is uh, willing to stand up for what is right according to the word of God, even if it means that it will not have the benefits of a society that thrives on oppression. Let's just read. The true church has always been persecuted always been persecuted from the day the Savior said it to the day he returns. The true church has always been persecuted. You are the church. Those of you who love God with everything you have, you made him Lord of your life. You love your neighbor as yourself. You are not being a stumbling block. That church. You're willing to stand up for what is right, even if it costs you everything worldly. Even if you lose friends, family, and so forth, because our true family, the Savior says, is those who does the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? 2 Peter 3, 9, it is the will of the Father that all repent and come on to salvation. But if there is no repentance for error in how we think and walk and we're acting it out as it's written in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, I can't walk with you. I can't roll with you. I'm going to pray for you. But until you reconcile back to God, we can't walk in agreement. I can forgive. That gets me off the hook to be able to live my life as I've been living it. But you still got to repent. Don't let this society tell you to forgive or forget everything that you've seen and forgive and let's all walk together because unless there is true repentance, you're walking with the enemy. Pray for your neighbor. Forgive your neighbor, but walk in authority. Don't be afraid to stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Jesus talks to the church at Smyrna in, in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 10, through John, who's at Patmos. He's exiled there, and the Spirit of God speaks through John as he wrote it down, and it says here, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. See, when you're in a system that is oppressing any child of God, the system that controls access to resources and so forth will not give you access to those things that will make you appear to be prosperous. You will have to struggle because the word that you have will set people free, but the devil wants you to think you're not effective. And people base how effective they are based on material things. But true influence and true power, or true power is your influence, your character. Character matters. Character matters. So Jesus deals with this at the church of Smyrna, and he says, um, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. What are you rich in? What do you mean? I don't have nothing. How can I be rich? Jesus, what you're talking about? Rich in the spirit. Because you have good character, and I'm with you. Here's the beauty in all of this. Jesus talked to the church. That is his he didn't have to knock to come in. He was already in. That's the richness, is that he will never allow you to be put to shame. The weapons may form, but they won't prosper against you. Brothers and sisters, we roll with Yahweh. He's the truth, the way, and the life. His son showed us the way back to him. And if we believe in what he showed us, we'll get to victory, brothers and sisters, because victory has already been won. He says here, I know about the slander of those who say they are of him and are not. Uh-oh. In this passage of scripture, he's talking about the Jews. But when you go deeper into the understanding of what the devil does with people who try to be gatekeepers to something they're not even on the inside on, those folks will slander you as if you don't know what you're talking about. They will tell you it's not the way. We are the teachers, not you. They, they love to come into your house and tell you how to run your house. 
but they can't take it when someone comes into their house and tell them you need to get your house in order. They always have been used to their voices being the only voice that's heard. But when there's pushback, they can't take it. Oh, something's being taken from me. No, what's being taken from you is you actually, the devil is removed, being removed from a situation so the light can be shined and you can be set free. Brothers and sisters, goes on to say, he says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You mean that a church can have devils in it? This is the time we reflect and look at ourselves. What's our character? Do we stand up for our neighbors? Do we show love? Are we forgiving? Do we walk in purpose? That's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, don't allow your identity to be aligned with any worldly thing. I'm saying don't speak on behalf of worldly things and make it yours. You speak on behalf of the kingdom and you stand on righteousness. He says, um, do not be afraid what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. He's always putting the ram in the bush, brothers and sisters. This was given thousands of years ago. So when someone comes to tell you that, okay, now the church is about to be persecuted, you turn and say to them, I've already been persecuted. I know what it feels like to be cast aside. I know what it's like to be made to feel disenfranchised. I know all of this stuff, but I have still persevered. I've operated in love, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You are now having to begin to learn how to operate that this way. Uh, there's some people who say, oh, now the, the church is going to have to go underground. Brothers and sisters, we've been underground. We've been underground because there was an oppression, an oppression but it never stopped us from going. Still I rise, still I rise, no matter what you throw at me, no matter what you try to do to me, still I rise. I have to rise from somewhere. You thought you had me underground, but I'm still rising above it because I'm walking in the spirit. Romans 8 verses 1 through 10 says, those who live in the spirit will have life, but those who operate according to the flesh will die. So guess what? When you're operating according to the the spirit you will walk above anything that's trying to take you out still I rise when you try to marginalize me still I rise when you told me I wasn't looking at what I actually saw with my own eyes still I rise when I use the word of God to discern what I see right in front of me still I rise because the savior is the gatekeeper the savior is the one who's recovered my sight the savior is the one who set my mind free from from the influence of demonic oppression. Brothers and sisters, I'm gonna leave you with these four points and I want you to tweet them, I want you to share them. Point one, the influence of demonic ideologies such as white supremacy is being judged right now. The ideologies, demonic ideologies, all, all sorts, all sorts of things, but the one that's out front at this moment is white supremacy. But any ideology that lines up with what we read in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, sexual immorality, hatred. If you hate your neighbor, even if they don't agree with you, I don't care which side of the aisle you fall on, judgment's coming against you. If you are a murderer, abortion, death penalty supporter, oppressed people, don't give them an opportunity to live because you feel like it's being taken from you, you're being judged. The devil picks a half word. So I'm gonna select social justice, but I don't care about the unborn. That don't work. Social justice is caring about the unborn. It's quiet in here because I know there's some folks that may say, I didn't know he was going to go over there. We stand on the whole word. Murder 
in any form is not of God. Murder in the womb. Ladies, I know, I know what you're saying. No person can tell me what to do with my body. You're absolutely right. But you will be held accountable if you don't follow the word of God. And your beef is not with me. Your beef is with him. People out there, if you see folks who are marginalized and being stumped on, you know it. You just turn the blind eye to it, but you're not speaking on it. Pastors, I don't care who you are in your congregation, because you feel like you're going to lose your congregation if you speak out on what is true. You're being judged. I stand here today as a prophet to tell you that what we are seeing for the church is true church is deliverance. For a long time, that demon hid itself up behind institutions. And then it told folks that these things don't exist. But what we witnessed was the existence of what we already had been seeing. Point two, stand back and remain blameless. I didn't say stand back and stand by. Stand back and remain blameless. Matthew 18, 7 says, woe to the world, for stumbling blocks must come, but woe to the person through which they come. In other words, the enemy is the one that is creating stumbling blocks in this world. But you, my child, should not allow his influence to come through you in the form of an action where people now are distracted by what you did to them, and they don't look to me, they just look to try to get back at you. Matthew 18, seven, woe to you too. Brothers and sisters, point three, pray for those who are blind to every ideology, but let me tell you the one ideology we've, we've been dealing with that has impacted all of us in westernized church is white supremacy. So pray for those who are blind to white supremacy's grip on their minds. Pray, you want people to be set free you want people to operate in freedom because here's the deal. When you are transformed by the Holy Spirit, you will want the same thing for everybody else. Freedom, operating in love, gentleness, kindness. You're not a pushover. You're just wise in how you move. And point four, victory is already won. Victory is already won. You just have to get in step with what the Savior says. He has already won it. Romans 8, verses 14 through 17 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are God's children. Now, if we are his children... Then we are heirs, heirs of God and called co-heirs co with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Brothers and sisters, that says it all. Many folks don't want to be persecuted because they can't handle it. But if you are the true church, you've already experienced persecution. You know what's coming. You know what's been going on. There's just some folks who's waking up to it. You're set free. We're set free because of the gospel, the gospel of our Savior who set us free. If you feel like you're not a part of the Savior, that you're not saved, this is the moment for you to give your life to him. If you're not sure where you would spend your eternity, if how you've been living your life is lined up with what you saw in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, this is the moment to have the Holy Spirit transform your life. Do you want to be saved? Repeat after me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and you were raised from the dead three days later with all power. And now you sit at the right hand of the Father. 
I am profoundly sorry for operating in a way that I see does not line up with your word. I give you permission to come into my heart and change me from the inside out. You are the son of God. If you prayed that prayer and you believe it in your heart, then you are on the right path. For those of you online, make sure you get baptized in his holy name. Find a good Bible-based church that's teaching you the whole word, not a partial word, so that you can operate in power, power of the Holy Spirit, not any human ideology that tries to make it about force. And watch you rise above everything in the earth. To God be the glory. Brothers and sisters, this is the day the Lord has made. I pray and hope that you have received the word today, crushing the influence of an oppressor. The great oppressor is Satan himself. Walk in love, walk in kindness. You are not anybody's doormat. Stay ready, but don't provoke. Watch and pray. In other words, keep your eyes open and pray. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. And watch what happens. To God be the glory. Brothers and sisters and those of you online, this is our time to give. I, listen, one of the things we learned in the book of Exodus, around Exodus 13, that when the enemy means something for your bad, in their thoughts, whatever it might be, it always comes back on them. All we want is good for people. So goodness will come upon us. And what we saw in Exodus 12 and 13, Pharaoh was so threatened by the Israelites, the children of God, that things got worse before they got better. In other words, there were plagues and things that would happen. But the last thing that would be the, 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 the glass breaker was something that came from the heart of Pharaoh. The thing that he worshiped the most, he thought others worshiped too, was his legacy. His legacy was based on his child, his son. So he gave out a command to kill all of the firstborn males of the slaves. And that word, God used it and slaughtered the Egyptians. Brothers and sisters, there's been so much going on where people were trying to wipe you out by not doing certain things because they thought that these things were, were going to take you out. If there's no repentance, watch it do the opposite. You will prosper and then there will be suffering for those who wanted you to suffer. To God be the glory. This is an opportunity to give brothers and sisters. You can give by texting your contribution to 901-244-4688. 901-244-4688. Let me tell you something. Also, what the Israelites did when that all happened, the father said, consecrate yourselves. Consecrate your firstborn and your first male um, animals. Consecrate. In other words, we belong to him. We belong to him, and they did. Their first fruits, their first things they gave to God. So today, give your first fruit. Give your best to God. Give your legacy to God. Give to God. Sow into good ground. And boy, you will prosper in ways that you never prospered before. And this is not the prosperity gospel that westernized church has tried to teach you. I'm talking about a peace that surpasses all understanding that as I give, I receive. I give not to receive, I give because I have, but God also makes sure I have to be a giver. As it is written in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully, for God loves a cheerful giver. The more you give, the more he can trust you with more to give. 
Cash App, dollar sign BGI Fellowship. Cash App, dollar sign BGI Fellowship. Or you can give online at bygodinspired.org. And for those of you who are snail mail, you can mail your contribution to BGI, P.O. Box 1042, South Haven, Mississippi, 38671. That's P.O. Box 1042, South Haven, Mississippi, 38671. To God be the glory. We're celebrating seven full years. We have a scholarship fund that's been established uh, at School Seed Foundation. And so you probably got an email. Um, make sure you sow into that too. This is not anything for the church. We want to be able to give to people and help people, help students attain college education. And so that's what we're about as a ministry. So make sure you, you involve yourself into the workings of this ministry. Let us all stand. 60 minutes, y'all. I might be over by five minutes. Repeat after me. I am an heir, a co-heir with Christ. Guess what? Abba Father. Abba Father. Let me hear you say it. Abba Father. Amen, brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for providing for us. Lord, protect us from danger seen and unseen as we thank you for removing the crushing influence of the oppressor on our minds as we can see clearly through your word how to move forward. In your holy name, let the church say amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. God bless each one of you.